Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. He voted against the 18.5% property tax increase in 2002. He voted against the city council pay raise to the chagrin of his wife in 2007. He refuses to accept Lulu's as a city council committee chair. He's been called a voice of fiscal reason, a maverick, a showboater, and a headline hunter. He's Tony Avella, councilman from the 19th district in Northeastern Queens. He's here to talk about the state of the city, the state of the city council, ethics, what <clears throat> bugs him, and why he's got the mayoral bug. Welcome, Mr. Councilman. Hey, great. Thanks for having me on the show. My pleasure. Now, wait a minute. Let's get some Queens <laughs> business straightened out here. I grew up in the real Queens. I grew up in Woodhaven. You represent... Bayside, College Point, Little Neck, Douglas, and these, this isn't Queens. You forgot Whitestone. Whitestone, <laughs> okay. This isn't Queens, this is the suburbs. No, you know? it's not. Oh, Long Island Sound. Describe describe your district briefly for the folks. Well, it, re it basically goes from College Point to, to Little Neck along the North Shore. And it is a suburban community, but that's what's great about Queens. And each neighborhood in Queens is different, and that's why people live there. I'm a lifelong Queens resident and wouldn't live anyplace else. Yeah, and some of us, unfortunately, left and can't get back in. If you can do something about that, we'll do it. Your background is in government. You were an aide to Peter Vallone. You were with Koch and Dinkins. Sort of give me a, a brief bio sketch of Tony Ovella. Well, I've always wanted to, to help people. I like helping people, and I always wanted to be in government. I started working for Peter Vallone as a, you know, just a council manic aide, mm -hmm. and then I went to, to, from his office to work for Koch. I found I like it. At the same time, I've always been involved in the community, being a civic president, uh, being on my own community board for nine years. And I feel I bring expert, a certain amount of expertise, but also a, a unique perspective to the job of being an elected official. I know both sides, being a civic person, and a governmental mm -hmm. person. I know what the community expects, I know what government should do, and I know what it can't do. When did you decide to run? I mean, you know, a lot of civic leaders then move up to elective office. Was there a triggering event? Your, your predecessor was Mike Abel, right? right? the Republican. Okay. Right. I'm actually the first, first Democrat in a yeah, long time. Yeah, the first time. Democrat to represent that council district mm -hmm. because it was created when the council was expanded. Right. Actually, yeah, I, got, I got the bug yeah, in know. college. Because um, I and you're like, you're a CUNY guy, right? Yes. You're on the political science. Hunt, Hunt to we'll college. talk about the professors later. <laughs> we'll give them an evaluation. But go ahead. No, when I was in college, I, I didn't like the way I saw the city and the country going, and I said, "Well, let me get involved. Let me see if I can make a difference." Never dreamed I'd be in the position that I am, and I found just being involved in civics. If you really want something done, you've got to be in the inside, and that's when I decided to run for public office. And the city council. And then you won in 2001, you won in 2003, and you won, won in 2005. 2005. You're getting term limited. We'll, we'll talk about your <laughs> mayoral ambitions in a moment. But what about term limits? I mean, you're the beneficia you were the beneficiary of it early, and now you're the victim of it if you Correct. were late. Right. What do you think of them? Did I they support term limits. I supported it in the beginning. I wouldn't be in... Uh, public office. I wouldn't be in the city council if not for term right. limits because the power incumbency is tremendous. E even the, the worst elected official is very hard to beat uh, because of the power of the incumbency. So I support term limits. Um, I'm against the, uh, the thought of overturning term limits. The people have voted twice in two public referendums. Their voice could not have been clearer. Mm -hmm. Keep term limits. And I've already made a public commitment. Even if the city council, because there's rumors, been rumors about it, even if they overturn it, I will not serve a third term. Because I campaigned on term limits, mm -hmm. and I'm going to keep my word to the people in my district and the city. This is what makes you particularly, <laughs> you know, welcome among your colleagues. You know, I'm, again, I'm, I'm in favor of term limits. I don't want to pay raise. I don't take a Lulu. Do you you get, do you, no. how, do, how do your fellow members react to you? 
Well, some of them understand where I'm coming from. Obviously, some of them don't like it because I'm embarrassing some of them. Right. Do you know, part of the reason I ran for public office, other than to do the, the job and specific issues like mm -hmm. zoning, which we'll, right, we'll, talk, we'll, we'll about. talk about later, was to restore people's faith in elected officials. I made commitments to the, to the people of my uh, district and the people of the city. I'm going to keep them, okay. even if it hurts me. Right. And, you know, for example, like the pay raise. We were elected with a $90,000 salary. I think it's unethical for the council to increase its own, its own pay. I'm going to take that salary. I refuse the pay raise based upon that. The same thing with term limits. We were elected for uh, two four-year terms. We were elected with a $90,000 salary. It's unethical for us to try and change the, quality, the parameters of the job once we're in there. Okay. So the rules of the game, in a sense, are sacrosanct. You're not, you would not be adverse to changing the salary. And in fact, you introduced <laughs> amendments. We're very, I mean, in, in a sense, it was historic that the, the speaker allowed you, in a sense, to introduce the amendments to the legislation on the floor. And what, why don't you talk about your sure. amendments and, and how they related to the actual bill? There were, there were three things. One, because I felt it was unethical for the council to increase its own salary. The first part of the amendment was to make it for the next class of council members, which, which would come be in January 1st, 2010. 2010. So that way, if you really think it, it's, it's needed and uh, meritorious, it's for the next class. We're not voting for ourselves. Sure. That's what Congress does. That's what the state legislature does. The other amendment would have been to make the position full time. Because even with the salary increase, members can still earn outside income. Mm -hmm. The last amendment would have been to eliminate Lulu's. Explain what, what a Lulu is. Lulu is, and if you want to use the diplomatic term stipend, it's basically a reward for doing extra work. So if you're the chair of a committee, like I'm chair of the Zoning mm -hmm. and Franchises Committee, or you're in a, lead a leadership position of the council, you get extra money. And there's a, there's a hierarchy among committee from, from right. finance and land use down to whatever, whatever it, it is. It goes from, I believe, $4,000 to like $23,000 a person. Significant. And that, does, and that doesn't go into your budget. That, that's added on to that $90,000 And 46 salary. out of 51 <laughs> council yeah. members are either in the Correct. leadership. Excuse me. This is, <laughs> this is a nice... Well, who well, are the four? people and why don't they get anything? <laughs> well, see, that's, that's my whole argument. It's really not for doing extra work. It's really a way the leadership of the legislative body, in this case the council, keeps their members in line. Because if you do something the leadership doesn't want, they'll threaten to remove your, your extra money. But, but don't leaders need carrots and sticks in order to lead? No. Aren't you taking well, away? Why not do the right thing? Right. Why not look at? Well, I'm a political scientist. Come on. Why not look at issues on the merits and do the right thing? If you have a good bill, people will vote for it. If you have a bad bill and you're the speaker and you're pushing a bad bill, you have to threaten people to vote for it. Isn't there something wrong with that? Uh, okay. So we not to get too far no, off no, no, the no, tangent. No, 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 no. Go ahead. But that's why we should get rid of Lulu's because they're a way the leadership controls the body for all the wrong reasons. I don't accept my Lulu. I'm entitled to $8,000 each year as chairman of the zoning committee. I've never accepted it because it's anti-good government measure. We should do away with it. And that was the third amendment that I had in my uh, resolution. Now, yes, the speaker actually was historic allowing it to go ahead. If she didn't allow it to go ahead, it would have been worse for her. In terms of the public? Oh, in terms of the editorial boards of the city of New York. But she allowed it to go ahead, and I appreciate that. Unfortunately, only one other council member voted with me. In Who voted with you? Uh, council member Darlene Mealy. Uh -huh. And in fact, you know, when she voted with me and she said yes on the floor of the city council, council members actually looked, who, who dared to, to vote with Avella? It, it was really a disgrace. Oh. But it was historic. Even the New York Times reporter right, right. asked, was going around, when was the last time we ever had a vote on the floor? Nobody Never. could remember. Okay, let's, let's talk about, well, the mayor on Wednesday, this Wednesday is going to uh, give his State of the City address. What, is, what do you expect him to say, and what is Tony Avella's take on the State of the City January 2007? Well, I think the mayor's basically going to say the city's moving in the right direction. We're moving ahead. We have a surplus this year, but we, sh we should manage the surplus. And, and I would agree with him in general. But my take on what's going on in this city is we don't take care of the individual citizen. 
the individual New Yorker. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you asked, went up on the street and just stopped 10 people and said, what do you think is going on? Do you think we're moving in the right direction? They'll say yes. But if you ask them, well, what has been your individual dealing? Did you ever have a pothole? Did you ever have a problem with your property mm -hmm. tax? Um, do you ever have a problem with a police response? Then you're going to get this outpouring of emotion. Oh, this bureaucracy. Uh, I, I made this phone call to 311. Mm -hmm. I never got satisfaction. Mm -hmm. That's something we really should be concentrating on. And that's what my whole campaign for mayor is going to be about, is that we don't take care of New Yorkers. We don't take care of promoting the, the viability of neighborhoods in this city. Okay, how do you do that? Let, let me interrupt you sure. there, because you are very concerned, both in, in your interest as well as your position as head of zoning and franchises with development and you've been actively involved with uh, the planning commission, the planning department. What exactly do you mean when you talk about dealing with the individual on the ground and communities and how how do you do that as mayor without having, don't you have to deal with the big stuff? Well, obviously you have to deal with the big stuff, but there should be a balance between the big stuff and the little stuff. And we should be making sure, one, that 311 system does work. I mean, it, it's a good idea. It's not to where it should be because there's no follow-up. All you do is submit a complaint and nothing ever happens. So you need some kind of performance evaluation. Absolutely. One of the things that I did as a civic leader um, 20 years ago, I designed like a simple civic action checklist. And I just distributed in my community. It's just like, do you have a broken street light? Do you have a puddle, right. et cetera? And people would mail them back to me. And, and I would You should do contact. real surveying. Well, that's e exactly. And that was my first newsletter as a city council person. And we got thousands of responses. We should be doing that. We should be reaching out, not waiting for people to call us. We should be reaching out to every citizen in this city. When you talk about neighborhoods, if you ask somebody where they live, they don't say, I live in New York City. I live no, in Bay Ridge. I live, I live in, in Bayside. Woodhaven. You're right. right. I live Which in Chelsea. Right. Exactly. We should be looking and working with community leaders and the community boards in each neighborhood and say, what's wrong with your neighborhood today? What do you need to have done? Where do you want to see it in five years, 10 years? Put together a, community, a real community-based planning document. Revolutionize the way we do zoning in the city of New York. Because right now we do it from the top down. We need to do it from the bottom up. So people feel they have a stake in their own neighborhood of where it's going to be now, five, and ten years down the road. Enhance neighborhoods. Make sure that every neighborhood has a senior center. Make sure every neighborhood has like a town square or a town hall so that we incorporate the best of every neighborhood. And I think if we did that, this city would be a much better place, not only for the individual citizens, but for intergroup harmony as well. Is this practical? <clears throat> Absolutely. In the governmental, building the infrastructure, providing the human capital, this is doable. Oh, absolutely. In fact, other cities across the country are doing it. For, for example, uh, Seattle, Washington has actually been doing this real community-based planning. And that's what I'm trying to base my model on. I'm working with the Municipal Arts Society right. to come up with legislation to change the whole land use process in this city. Okay, let's, let's for a moment, move to the arcane world of zoning. Zoning is, to most of us, you know, hieroglyphics, even though we understand Absolutely. ultimately that it means that our most valuable resource, land, is somehow regulated. Just talk a bit about the nature of zoning, the problems with zoning, the current problems with overdevelopment, but at the same time opening up other areas to both residential and commercial development. Well, it's interesting because I've been talking about zoning for 20 years. Um, and 20 years ago, nobody paid any attention uh, to the issues related to zoning. I believe that every single quality of life issue that somebody may have in a particular neighborhood is directly related to improper zoning. Last time the zoning was done in, in the city of New York was 1961 comprehensive. I know. And they thought at that, the city fathers at that time thought there was going to be 30 million people in the city. So they built in a zoning uh, document design that in effect allowed for greater development in every neighborhood. 
didn't happen, is it necessary? And it led to the destruction of the quality of life in many communities. What I'm trying to do with city planning and the mayor as chair of the zoning committee is go into every neighborhood, look at what the existing zoning is, and see, yes, see where we can have some development. But the most important thing is to preserve the character of these neighborhoods mm -hmm. which are being destroyed by overdevelopment. It is a huge problem, and that's one of the things that uh, I'd like to change as mayor. Preserve the neighborhood, preserve the quality of life, enhance the community. I've had many people, many middle class families tell me if we don't do something about the quality of life because of this overdevelopment issue, they're leaving the city of New mm -hmm. York. It could be the next exodus of the middle class. And if that happens, this city is going to be in dire straits. Is it in dire straits or has it just become a different city, a city where the the more wealthy have taken in, taken the housing of the middle class? So you have sort of this elite cosmopolitan city on one hand, and then you have a poorer city in the other, and you don't have that middle. I mean... Uh, you know, I don't even know if there's an answer to that question, because first of all, the housing is now so expensive that kids growing up in their own neighborhood can no longer afford to live there. And people who left, right. unfortunately, a while ago can't, can't get come back. back. I actually had a situation where two attorneys who work in the court system tried to get their first daughter house in Queens. They couldn't afford it. They had to move out of the city. It's, and I think it's forcing people to live beyond their means to those who want to buy a house, mm -hmm. want to do the American dream in this city. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen when the economy declines a little bit? You're going to see a lot of foreclosures. It's actually happening outside the metropolitan area across the country. Mm -hmm. Hasn't hit here yet. We have to design a system by which people who want to live in this city can afford to live in this city. And that goes That's, back to zoning, too. Okay. You know, you, we're putting into place new zoning and so-called affordable housing. But, in fact, we just had a reform passed by the city council for 421A, which is a right. tax abatement program for uh, developers. Um, I voted against the measure because I don't think it goes far enough. We're basing, for example, affordable housing on the citywide average median income. That's way too high. high. So when you do 80% of the average median income, in, and you're supposedly making it for uh, lower income families. Not so. Not so, right. because the lower income families can't even afford that. Right. I'm actually in the process of introducing legislation to change the entire formula to make it neighborhood AMI. So that What's when, AMI? Uh, average median income. Okay. So that when we do affordable housing in a neighborhood, the people in that neighborhood could afford it. Right now, we're not doing that. Okay. So we're not doing So it's indexed housing. to the peculiarities of the neighborhood. Correct. Okay. I mean, and this, this is all related to zoning. Okay. Do you know, if you have, for example, let's talk about quality of life, truck traffic, noise, pollution. If you have manufacturing commercial right next to residential, you've got a problem. Mm -hmm. 1961, they never put in a buffer zone between those districts. All of these things have got to change. Don't we need a new master plan, master zoning document? Absolutely. But and we're not doing it. We're doing piecemeal. But the master document should be based from the bottom, from the community up, not oh, from the top down. Okay, let's talk about how, talk about the City Planning Commission and its work. In fact, there was a big front page piece on the chairman, Amanda Burden, assess the City Planning Commission? Um, I think Amanda is probably one of the best uh, commissioners of the Department of City Planning that we've ever had. Having said that, are they going far enough and fast enough? Absolutely not. We're moving at a snail's pace. And I have to tell you that the, the attitude of the Department of City Planning before the mayor's re-election and after the mayor's re-election has changed dramatically. Before the mayor's re-election, the mayor agreed with me we were moving ahead expeditiously in all these rezonings, contextual zonings. What's your trouble, Mike? Uh, down zoning. Well, but he agreed with me because people right. want these down zones. Right. But? But after the mayor's re-election, now we seem to have a different uh, attitude. The mayor's pushing development. And obviously, city planning has gotten their marching orders. All these rezonings that we've been doing, these down zonings, mm -hmm have slowed to a crawl. We're not doing enough. And one of the things that I want city planning to do, and they agree with me, but it's like taking forever, is creating new zoning categories 
to accurately re, uh, reflect yeah, well, you did, housing you, stock. Like an R2, I mean, mm -hmm. let's not talk about that. It, it's That's too race organic. too specific. Right. <laughs> yeah, but essentially what you're facing in your communities, the communities that you represent, is you've got overdevelopment, multifamily houses creeping into single family, but also you have what we have in the suburbs, these giant McMansions. How do you how do you stem that? The only way you can do that is through zoning, because the, only the money way you is going to drive it. Right. The only way you stop it is to create zoning categories that restrict these type of developments. And we and I actually created a zoning district that stops the McMansions. But you have to be rezoned under that category, um, because not every, some people like big houses, some people don't. It's up to the individuals, and it should it should be up to each neighborhood. But the one thing that I found is that every community, every borough, even Manhattan, are complaining about overdevelopment. They may have different aspects of the problem, but everybody wants to see a stop to the crass overdevelopment where buildings go up and they're out of character with the neighborhood. Nobody's against development. We need that. But it has to be proper. It has to fit in with the community. It should be an asset and not a detriment. Okay. And you've been, you've also, <laughs> in, in your Councilmanic work and you're outside of the council work, been very involved with uh, landmark and landmark preservation. Your 2005 uh, demolition by neglect bill was signed by Bloomberg into law, and that, that went pretty far in preventing the willful destruction of landmarks. Talk about that. I'm actually very proud of that. You know, New York City has one of the strongest landmark laws in the country. But the one thing we didn't have the power to do is if when an owner of a landmark property deliberately neglected to building to the extent that it, it right. would collapse. In fact, in Staten Island, they lost the famous landmark because the property owner went in during the dead of winter, opened all the windows and turned on all the faucets and then just walked away. The water ran, the pipes burst, the Department of Buildings had to go in and declare the building uh, unsafe and it had right. to be demolished. My bill, in effect, which is now law, says that the Landmarks Preservation Commission has the power to go into court and sue a property owner civilly for three times the amount that the property is worth when they see a property owner intentionally doing this. Mm -hmm. And they're already putting it into practice. It's a huge benefit to stop destruction of landmarks in the city. But you know, even the preservation of landmarks, that goes into zoning again. We're not doing enough to preserve our historic treasures in this city. They're disappearing left and right. And again, it goes to this overdevelopment issue because the, the money involved in this is just so immense. And you know, your, uh, your listeners, your viewers, um, I don't know whether they're gonna agree with me or not, but the one thing that troubles me is how much the real estate industry moves this city. They are the movers and the shakers, more so than the elected officials. They so control the this agenda. This is, there is this permanent government. Oh, I call it a secret government because I have a number of pieces of legislation to reform the land use process, to reform the Department of Buildings. You're really popular with these guys. <laughs> and they're opposing this legislation, but you'll never know it because they do it behind the scenes. How? By just calling up elected officials and saying, I want, to call, you know, I want to kill this bill. They'll never come to a public hearing and say what's wrong. They'll do it behind the scenes. Who are these nefarious secret power holders? Well, they're the real estate industry, you know, the real estate industry, the big, you know, the, the Trumps of the world. You know, and I'll use his name, but I don't want, you know, in general, because the people can identify with the individual. Right. But it's, it's the real estate industry themselves. And they have so much power, it is ridiculous. I'll give you one specific example. I had a, a bill to restrict residential construction on the weekends for religious observance and, and quality of life mm -hmm. in low density neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have stopped the homeowner from doing something, but it would have stopped developers mm -hmm. from building. Mm -hmm. The bill was moving ahead. We had a hearing. Everybody was in favor of it. This was during uh, Gifford Miller's tenure as speaker. Mm -hmm. Gifford Miller goes to a meeting of the real estate industry in Staten Island. They get up. Oh, Avella's bill is terrible. We got to stop this. He comes back the next bill. The, 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 the next day, the bill is dead. And I've been trying to resurrect it ever since. So you're not a fan of the former speaker? No, because he was running for mayor and he paid too much attention to, to where the money was coming from. Is, is the current speaker as tied to these real estate interests as, or is it just inevitable? Well, it, it is um, if you decide as soon as you become speaker that you're going to run for mayor. Um, 
And I think, unfortunately, the current speaker is is leaning towards that. And I'm rather disappointed. I supported uh, Christine Quinn. But, for example, one of the things... Okay, that, now we're into mayoral right. politics. We're talking about <laughs> you and the opponents. Go ahead. Right. One of the things that I've campaigned... Um, campaigned, fought for as a member of the city council is reform of this little known agency called the Board of Standards and Appeals, which is five commissioners. They, they in effect, allow the variances of the city. You know, we can change the zoning all we want. If, the, if BSA allows these variances, sure. we've accomplished nothing. So I've introduced legislation to, in effect, give the council oversight over the Board of Standards and Appeals. Speaker Quinn, when she was a council member, was actually, a, you know, signed on to my bill, was very supportive. Since she's become speaker, and the bill was being introduced with the new session. She hasn't signed on to it. She apparently is not in favor of it at this point. And you're ascribing this to mayoral ambition and right. the power yes. of the real estate. Yeah. Okay. You announced for mayor in July of 2006. Correct. And the election, okay, now. Got to start early. You got to start early. Now, the question is, a New York Times piece characterized your campaign as minimalist. You're your own campaign manager. You're your own press secretary. Your campaign office is a cell phone. We're just getting started. Uh, wait a minute. My question <laughs> is, what are you smoking? Why, I mean, how does but, Tony Avella become the mayor of the city of New York? Well, you've first got of all, with, Billy Thompson. You've got Carrie Own. You've got people with half billion dollar bank accounts. Well, I how think do you there's, do this? Well, there's two things. One, you mentioned half billion dollar bank accounts. I think it's disgraceful the amount of money that you need to run for citywide office in this city. You either have to be very rich, or quite honestly, you have to sell your soul to raise that type of money. We shouldn't have a system that makes that happen. But you have it. But, well, I'm gonna fight against it. I'm not gonna raise that type of money. I, I know it, I'm not even gonna try. And I'm not selling my soul to raise that type of money. This is gonna be a very grassroots campaign. This is a campaign that has to be fought. One, we need to, we need to show that you can win a citywide office without raising huge amounts of money and without, in effect, selling your soul to, the, let's say, to the real estate industry. Two, it can be done. And if it's based on real issues and a grassroots campaign, which is my campaign, mm -hmm. that's what it's going to be about, we can win. So this, I mean, a novella <laughs> campaign is essentially, is in some ways a populist, grassroots, neighborhood-based campaign. Absolutely. What's, what's, what's the five-word five, five soundbite? What's the message? Community, neighborhood. Okay. Two words. Two words. Community and neighborhood. And this is it. And that's you're going to win. Well. When the word gets out, you know, obviously when we go further along, there'll be positions on various issues. Sure. The anti-property tax, the anti-tax person, the, you know, good government, ethics person. Right. Um, reform in terms of land use and neighborhood and preservation and quality of life. These are things that people are concerned about. And I think we're going to surprise a lot of people at the end. Good luck. Thank you so much. Pleasure being here.